Steve Adubato here. This is Lessons in Leadership every Sunday, 10 o'clock, News 12 Plus, plus a variety of other digital platforms. I have Mary Gamba, my uh, co-anchor and executive producer, is about to tell everyone. Mary, how are you doing today? I'm doing really great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Tell everyone where they can find us first. Sure thing. First and foremost, go to our website, stand-deliver.com. Uh, we have all of our different outlets listed there, plus a lot of great free articles, information, columns on leadership and communication. And if you're not watching us on News 12 Plus, you may be listening to us right now on Audible, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can also find us on nj.com, roinj.com, and a variety of other online and digital outlets. You know, I know we're taping this at the end of 2021 and spring training in baseball is not for many, many months. But Mary, one of the greatest leaders in sports, particularly on the Yankees, I'm drinking out of this cup. Who would that be, Mary? If, <clears throat> if, if I could see it correctly, that would be Derek Jeter the using great the, uh, the Derek announcer. Jeter. <laughs> now, who, Number who, two. Was the, who was the Yankee broadcaster? that passed away and they still use his voice. Bill Gamba, my husband is going to kill me because I can't remember his name. It will be told by the end of the show. Mary, you can Google it. Uh, more importantly, let's uh, introduce our special guest, Mary. I'm gonna give you that honor. I would love to. So uh, today we have joining us Stacy Grant. She is the Vice President Benefits Division of Henry O. Baker Insurance Group and also the Deputy Legislative Legislative State Chairperson for the New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters. Stacey, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Steve. I'm so excited to be here, and a big thank you to Delta Dental of New Jersey for the introduction. Yeah, Delta Dental brought us together. Delta Dental of New Jersey is making our series on small business and lessons in leadership possible. By the way, your connection to Delta Dental, let everyone know. I, um, I represent their products, small businesses and medium-sized businesses. So let me ask you something. Um, you deal with small businesses all the time. You, mm -hmm. you, you help them, you support them, you connect the dots for them, et cetera. Do you think it's, there's any significant difference in leading a small business versus a major large corporation or is leadership just leadership, Stacey? You know, what, what I see with my clients is small and large, I would say that leadership is leadership. It's the logistics as to how you maybe execute on that leadership, but leadership is leadership. And that is not only on small business, right? We could even say that in our personal lives, we have to be good leaders within our family community, within our friend community. So I don't think that leadership discriminates based on, on the size of your employer or the size of your family or just you as an individual. We all have the ability to lead, whether again, individually in our own home or as an employee in a business, small or large, or as an actual leader or executive in that business. Yeah, pick it up, Mary. Sure thing. So Stacey, I know you and I had spoken in preparation for this interview and I was very fascinated by learning exactly what it means to be a broker and really how that ties to employee morale on the back end. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I'll oversimplify it. A broker is really that go-between between the end user, so the policy holder, whether it's an employer or an employee, and the policy, so whatever the insurance policy is. So that's really oversimplifying it. But if you look to all of the different things that really is what a broker is, and it's those things that have kept me do, by do, doing this for 25 plus years and kept me doing it and loving it for 25 plus years, is that we have the very unique ability because of all of the training that we have to do, the certifications, the licenses that we have to have, the knowledge that we need on a daily basis to be able to get, retain, and then be able to give back to you all. We have the ability, and I'll say the responsibility, to help individuals, employers, and their employees mm -hmm understand something that to most people is like listening or learning a foreign language for the first time. Mm. You know, it's such, a, it's such a complicated industry with so many different moving parts, um, which is why obviously, you know, politically we struggle sometimes with trying to find what works for everybody. But what we're able to do and, and help with the employer, for example, is we're able to round out their employee benefit package so that maybe they can attract and retain those employees or even on a more granular level, we're able to help an individual or that employee 
that is so uncomfortable because they just went for lab work and they got this bill for $1,600. Come to us and we're able to help them, give them peace of mind, and then help be their advocate with the insurance company so that we can go back to them and say, no, you don't owe the 1600, not in all circumstances, but you only owe a small portion of that. And that peace of mind, I think is really what the benefit component brings to employees on an employer level. And when you have that peace of mind on the, as an employee on the employer level is you have a higher job satisfaction, which adds to the overall morale. Hey, so but, let's, let's do this, Stacey. We're gonna put yeah. up the uh, Delta Dental website so people sure. can uh, check out who and what Delta Dental is, now they can find out more. But I'm curious about something. Um, Mary told me about you before the Delta Dental people connected us, but we've only been on the air for a few minutes and there's something I'm picking up and I wanna play off it. You have tremendous energy, enthusiasm, passion, A. A, where does it come from? And B, what the heck does that have to do with great leadership? So where it comes from, um, besides a lot of coffee, <laughs> um, you know, I really think where it comes from is I believe in what I do. And I think that's also answering your question about what makes a great leader is having that passion. I love what I do. And, um, and something that I do want to mention that I don't think a lot of people realize is that as an insurance broker, we are an advocate not only for the individual in, as an intermediary for the insurance company, but we're also an advocate legislatively. I, I belong to the, as Mary had mentioned, the New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters. And we are an unbelievable group of people from all different disciplines in the insurance industry. But when we come together, we have that single passion and that single purpose. And that is a consumer advocacy organization to help people, whether it's by understanding the policy that just got put forward or the law that just got put forward, um, helping to forge the way for more common sense approaches to some of the laws and the, the regulations that formulate how we use and how we understand benefits. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but I no, think- No, you sure did. And I <laughs> wanna jump in because uh, one other thing, and it ties back to everything that you're talking about, that passion and just loving your job. And if, you're, if you make your people feel loved, they're gonna stay, that goes to attracting and retaining. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule. Um, <laughs> okay. It's something that we talked about offline and I was fascinated. I had never heard that comparison. I'm not sure if Steve has or our viewers have. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So the golden rule, most of us know that, right? And it's a, a great rule to always live by. And that is do unto others as you would have wanted them uh, to do on, uh, I'm sorry, do unto others as they would have, you would have wanted them to do unto you. And it's a great rule. We teach our kids it probably that you don't steal because you wouldn't want to be stolen from. You don't lie. You wouldn't want to be lied to. But the platinum rule, not to say that it's better, but I do think it has, it's more applicable in the work sense because it's due unto others as they would have wanted done unto them. And it really goes to that engagement of your employees or your friends. Again, we can bring this all to the personal level as well, but it goes to the engagement of your employees, making sure an active listener. Um, one of the examples I give is that, so I have a team of people inside our organization and I keep trying to want to show them I'm appreciating them and I want to buy them lunch. And they keep telling me no. And finally, I said to them, listen, guys, I'm trying to show you I appreciate you, you know, and I'm trying to offer you lunch, but you're not taking it. And the one person said to me, but I have a lot of allergies. I really can't eat much. So it's about being that active listener, about understanding your people, the people around you, whether it's your friends, your spouse, or your coworkers, or your employees. Mm. And out making sure that you're doing something to show them the appreciation that resonates with them. Because just because lunch is good with me, anything you put in my belly, I'm happy with, <laughs> doesn't mean that that's going to resonate and show they're not going to take it as appreciation, even though maybe you're showing it as appreciation. Yeah. Mary and I have, a, we have a chapter in our book, Lessons in Leadership. It's all about empathy or uh, leaders are great empathizers or they empathize. And the subtitle is, it's all about them. All, it's all about them is comparable to the platinum rule. Hey, Stacey, I want to thank you for joining us and also, uh, most importantly, thank our good friends at Delta Dental of New Jersey and this series on small business and its connection to leadership. 
So thank you, thank you, Stacey. Wish, we wish you and the family at uh, Delta Dental all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and I'd love to be back. You got it. I'm Steve, that's Mary, that's Stacey. We'll be right back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Disastrous detour. The chapel bells are ringing, but you're stuck, adding 10 points to a three-point turn. This looks like a job for smile power. Good thing your healthy smile is revved up with grin guarding affordable dental benefits. So your healthy smile can keep you on the right route. Unleash your smile power with Delta Dental. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Hey, Mary, before we plug our sponsors and also introduce uh, the interview with Dr. Nair from Caldwell University, do you know who the great late Yankee oh, PA you want to know what? was? I am on a three-minute delay, and I thought of it, and I think nope. I'm right, Bob, Bob Shepard. It's Bob. Mary, you just went on the internet and asked. No, I swear I didn't. I, I literally was going to look it up and it came to me. I'm on a three minute delay. My family knows it. You could prove it. Okay, but do you know how he did this? They did the Derek Jeter thing. He said he, for years when Derek Jeter was playing at toward the end of his career and mm -hmm. Bob Shepard has pa had passed, he was the only person that was announced with Bob Shepard's voice. Bob Shepard. I'm well didn't, aware. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you. He was in broadcasting heaven, but he was I announcing. Know, my... Go ahead. Derek. Gita. Gita. Number and two. You know what? Scarlin, the great camera operator here, didn't even pay attention to it because he was listening and watching the New York Mets out in Queens Ooh. and refused to watch the Yankees. So wouldn't even appreciate. He's actually, he's checking. He, right now he's on <laughs> Twitter. He's on Twitter. He's on social media. Anytime I talk about the Yankees, Derek Jeter, the great Bob Shepard, who, by the way, was a professor at, I forget what University of New York taught broadcast. That I don't know. His name yeah. I knew. I just had a, I All needed right. my three minute delay. By the way, that's the beauty of lessons in leadership. We talk about obscure things that only I care about, Mary cares about. Sometimes we both care about them, but Scarlin does not care about them. No, it's all right. Don't worry, buddy. Um, Mary, switch gears, pivot. Yes. Sponsors. Sponsors, yes, sponsors. We could not be here without all of you, so thank you. Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, uh, Seton Hall University and the Bacino Leadership Institute, Kessler Foundation, the North Ward Center, New Jersey Sharing Network, and Prager Metis. I think that uh, checked off all those boxes. Wouldn't it be awesome if we got the Yankees to be a sponsor? Oh my person? gosh, that would be amazing. That would be so cool. You know what? We're gonna have Michael Kay, our good friend Michael Kay, who was on our public broadcasting program when we were uh, out of the Tisch WNET studio at Lincoln Center. We're going to get them remotely. Um, yep. And, we'll and why don't we're we also going to put up in post. We took Will. I left work early one day. We took Will up to Bay Bruce Grave. He was probably three or four years old, the World Series, and everybody went up to like bring pizzas and tributes. And somebody got a picture of him from behind and was actually in the New York Post or whatever. I so, remember this. I yeah, swear I yeah. remember this, Mary. That was a big deal. It's, yeah, we'll put that in there, but that was really cool. So we are diehard Yankees fans. I didn't even know there was another baseball team in New York. So there isn't. They're the Mets. Yeah. They're not. They're not actually, not actually a major league team. Exactly. So uh... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so Mary, let's uh, set up Dr. Nair. Definitely. So uh, we're about to see a great interview with Dr. Nair, assistant professor of management, Caldwell University, and he's also the author of a book called Potluck Culture 
five strategies to engage the modern workplace. Let's go to Dr. Nara. Mary and I will talk about more things that people don't care about right after this. We're now joined by Dr. Ranjit Nair, who is an assistant professor of management at Caldwell University. Good to see you, doctor. Good to see you too, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great. Listen, I'm a student of leadership. I write about it, talk about it, make mistakes as a leader every day. It's a question I've been asking forever. You're a professor of management. You wrote this uh, wonderful book called Potluck Culture. Is there a difference between leadership and management? Uh, yeah, so there are is yeah, lots of differences, but there's a lot of similarities too. But leadership is about, you know, having a set of followers, right? Uh, management is about um, getting the organization, the people around it to execute against a, a, a set of goals. Uh, leadership is really about motivating. It's about, you know, role modeling. It's about having the character to lead, having the character to enable others to act. But I'm curious, in these difficult times, as we tape this program going into 2022, the new workplace combination, it's a hybrid, who's in person, who's remote. We have great producers on our team all over New Jersey and in other states right now. My job as the leader, and I when I say me, I'm talking about anybody who leads or man and or manages an organization. Is it harder and in what ways is it harder and or different to lead slash manage in this new workplace? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. And, and you know, COVID-19, 2020, 2021, we're still kind of in it. Uh, is really a watershed event for humankind, uh, and especially in the workplace. So new leadership skills, emerging leadership skills are sought after big time. There was a study recently done by McKinsey and some of the other these, these big consulting firms, and they came out with this, uh, uh, what are the top two things that are keeping CEOs um, awake at night post pandemic? And the biggest one that kind of surprised me is that they don't feel that their own employees yet and the employees that they're looking to hire have the requisite skills in the post-pandemic era. And when asked, what are these skills? Number one on the list was resiliency. And we know what resiliency is, just the, the ability to stand up and stay firm and, and keep going in the face of adversity. And so we've never seen adversity like we saw with the pandemic. So resiliency and being resilient, being adaptable, being flexible, you know, being uh, staying true to the narrative, your story and sticking behind your story and sticking to your mission, that's going to be really sought after going forward. Let me, let me uh, play devil's advocate a little bit here. And by the way, the book is called Potluck Culture. And, and by the way, uh, let's do, I'll do devil's advocate in a second. The primary theme of the book is? It's about engaging the workplace and you know, having gratitude, respect in the workplace. We spend so much of our time at work, right? So why don't we make that experience an amazing experience as opposed to clocking in and clocking out well, when you're there, be the human being that you are at work and demonstrate everything you can do to be the best version of you can be at work. So important now more than ever. Uh, so uh, let me do this devil's advocate thing. So a lot of us in leadership, those of us in leadership positions, we want to stay connected to our people. We want to understand what they're experiencing, how to be supportive of them, how to be helpful, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're physically not in the same location, are there any tips and tools you have for those watching right now who run any organization, who are leaders in any department, division, unit, whatever? How do we stay connected and engaged yeah. if we're not physically in the same office space? Yeah, and, and that's a reality now, right? We're, we're gonna move to a high, at least at a hybrid environment or certainly working remotely. And I think to stay connected, to answer your question, is to stay human, right? I, I don't know if you can see my background behind me. I think there's a picture of John Lennon. There's my- I see my, it. See um, John Lennon up top, right? right I, I'm a guitarist. Uh, see, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a human connection with you. And we don't want to lose that uh, when we are going remote, having sort of fake backgrounds and so on. So there is, there's a character to who I am. There's a humanity to who I am, and certainly for you as well. So that's one way to stay human, to stay connected while we're trying to be remote. You know, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that we learned that pretty much everyone can work effectively from home. You know, there's some nuances here and there, but we found that indeed, you know, when, when faced with the uh, sort of the uh, unexpected outcomes of the pandemic, we were pretty resilient. We were able to work from home remotely and, you know, uh, uh, and that's gonna be a mainstay going forward. 
But what we don't want to lose is we don't want to lose that human touch. You know, we don't want to lose that humanity, the personality. And I think uh, the, the more important thing there, Steve, is uh, we have to be, you know, we, we often use the word empathy, you know. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking of empathy and Dr. Daniel Goleman, emotional intelligence, right. a big part of emotional intelligence, I won't get on my soapbox, is this ability to empathize with other others. Is it harder to empathize if you're physically not together or if we're committed I don't want to answer my own question. If we're committed to being empathetic and caring about others, it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. You tell you me. Know, yeah, we, you know, we get Googled, right? I mean, I Googled you, and I, I'm sure you Googled me. Well, that Googling can be part of empathy, right? Putting yourself in the shoes of that person, learning about that person before you have that remote connection with them or that remote work experience. There's a lot that we can do to do our homework, to, to beef up our empathetic orientation. And of course, while we're in the moment or in the video with that person while at work, there's a lot of things we can do to to you know feel what our um, coworkers feeling. You know, asking them uh, how their day is going, what's bothering them, and how they can be of help. So empathy can go a long way, very broad and very deep. Uh, real quick, uh, by the way, uh, Caudill University, a higher ed partner of ours, I've taught there for many years in a doctoral program for educational administrators who uh, we did it remotely last year. I'm hoping we can do it in person this year. Before I let you go, do you differentiate between empathy and showing, quote, gratitude for your team members? I think it's, they both come hand in hand. You know, empathy is, is and he, as they say in uh, uh, that famous book, uh, Atticus Finch, you know, where he said to really demonstrate- Bill Mockingbird. Exactly, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a legend of a book. And, he said something like, to demonstrate true empathy, you got to crawl into the skin of that person. There's so much we can do to get into who that individual is, what they're going through, and most importantly, living their experience. But gratitude goes hand in hand with that. You know, as I mentioned before, we spend so much of our time in economic or business environments or college or studying, less fun, more work. Well, in that regard, it's always good to turn to someone and say, you know, really appreciate what, you, what you've done and thank you for being here. And, you know, um, um, I want to recognize you for what, you, what you've gone through, what you've accomplished. The more we do that, the better it is for the workplace. You know, as I let uh, Dr. Nair go, it's so interesting how he said that, thanking people, showing gratitude, appreciation. There's some people I've, in my other life that I've coached over the years. Uh, as leaders and managers to say, what, what do you mean? I'm going to thank someone for doing their job. And I'm thinking, you can never really say thank you enough. And people don't get tired of hearing you. So yeah. don't take it from me. Take it from Dr. Nair. Hey, doctor, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you on campus. Thank you. And I'm teaching in that leadership program tomorrow. So the same one you taught. Thank you, Steve. I'm ready. Thank you, doctor. Uh, all, uh, that's Dr. Nair from Caudill University. And we're right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Steve Adubato, welcome back. To thank uh, Dr. Nair and the folks uh, up at the University of Caldwell for uh, doing that. By the way, I'm teaching a course, I believe, at Caldwell in the spring again, Mary. On It's a doctoral program on mm -hmm. crisis leadership for educational administrators getting their doctorate. Am I correct on that? You are absolutely correct, and it's something great. You've done it uh, every year with Bob Mann. And it's just been really great and fascinating to work with these uh, educators and dealing, helping them to deal with their real life challenges, especially in COVID, even before COVID, but now with COVID. But I'm especially excited to be teaching at the Bucino Leadership Institute at the great Seton Hall University with Dr. Brian Price. I'll be doing that in the spring as well, right? That is correct. Can everybody just get along? I know everyone competes with each other. And by the way, Scarlin made a snarky point because he woke up and said, you know what? The Yankees and the Mets played Six games this year, and the Mets won four. The Yankees only won two, as if anyone cares about that. Um, 
So, Mary, let's do this. You said you wanted to talk about a chapter in the new book that you and I are writing together um, mm -hmm. on leadership. It's a follow up to lessons in leadership. And the chapter is called? Uh, Artful Con Confrontation. I know we've been playing around with the name, but great leaders artfully confront. We're playing around. But at the bottom line of the chapter is you must confront things, that, whether it's something that goes wrong, whether it's you need to tell bad news to a friend or a family member. If somebody wrongs you, you need to confront it if it's a if it's one of your team members and they're not working up to par because by not confronting it, by burying your head in the sand, it's only going to make matters worse. Yeah, let me play a little devil's advocate here. Since I wrote the chapter and you edited it, it is devil's advocate because I agree with what's in the chapter. I want to clarify that since my name's on the book. So um, come on, you're saying leaders should get into arguments and, and contentious disagreements with people on their team? What the heck is this artful confrontation and what does that have to do with leadership? It's all about nuance. The artful in the word right there talks about being artful in the way that you confront. We're not saying be contentious. We're not saying make it about the person and their personality or something personal about them. You're really making it about the situation using uh, a very, uh, make sure your tone is right. Make sure the words that you choose are accurate and keep it to the facts and not really go down a rabbit hole of accusations, pointing fingers, things like that. You know how I know about artful confrontation? Because you use it a lot. Because I also use inartful confrontation, yes. which we're not going to go into again. But <laughs> nope. there are have you and I been in inartful confrontations in the past? Yes. And it's so funny because you'll call them spirited conversations. So when we're having a spirited dialogue, that usually means that <laughs> the, the tone is uh, raised, the words and the uh, energy level is raised. And my, and wife, better, Jennifer worse, and I, my wife, Jennifer, and I get into spirited conversations sometimes. And by the way, you and Bill, your, your terrific husband, do you always artfully confront and he artfully we, confront? I, and I know you're not going to believe this. We don't argue. Um, and I think because we are both no BS people, we just want to, and that's where I get it from. I just want to get to the solution right away. If it's something, you know, if it's who took the, the biggest argument in our house is who's taking all the iPhone chargers at, you know, next to the couch. And no blame. I'll just, there's no blame. No, no, but I'll just, you know, I'll be like, listen, maybe it was me, maybe it wasn't. I'll buy a new one and it's here the next day because thank God for Amazon. Maybe the Gamba home a is a no blame home. Yeah. They're one of one of gazillions in the state and the, the country. It's a no blame <laughs> home. Um, we just move on. I, I don't have enough energy to fight to go back and forth and whatever it is. If it's yes. somebody didn't take the garbage out, just take it yes. out. Hey, listen, it is great to co-host a show with Gandhi. And Mary is the Gandhi of leadership. She's a combination of Gandhi and Deepak Chopra. Very chill, no blame. Yes, what is Elvin saying? Goodbye, I need to learn. Uh, oh, he says he needs to learn from Mary. <laughs> yeah, uh, first you need to have to spell Mary. Oh, and he, he corrected himself. He corrected himself. Thank you, Elvin. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Sylvester. Thank you, Amy. Thank the team. And no thank Frank blame. one more time. Frank, what? thank you. I'm thanking Frank again. There is no blame on this show. See you next week. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Disastrous detour. The chapel bells are ringing, but you're stuck, adding 10 points to a three-point turn. This looks like a job for smile power.
Good thing your healthy smile is revved up with Grin Guarding Affordable Dental Benefits. So your healthy smile can keep you on the right route. Unleash your smile power with Delta Dental.